So I get it when you say trust no man, but you can trust God. Good morning, Roots in Christ family. Thanks for joining us again this Sunday here at Roots in Christ Ministries, where we live in faith and we love in Christ. Saints, I want to thank you for your continued support of Roots in Christ Ministries, financially as well as just your presence, your communications. I am really appreciative of you, so I praise God for you. Additionally, thanks for supporting the new animation uh, that we created. This is the beginning of many more to come, but thank you for viewing that, viewing that and your, your tremendous uh, feedback. Tell you what, saints, I have a lot to read. A little bit to say because we're going to let God's word speak for itself. Amen. But if you would, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Psalm chapter 33. Psalm chapter 33, starting at verse 1. And we're going to read all of Psalm 33, but speak to a little bit of it. And it reads, Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song, play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the earth, who forms the hearts of all who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army, no warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our Hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. I'd like to use for a subject today in response to the question of how do we fix this problem? The only solution is to trust in God. How do we fix these issues in this world? The only solution is to trust in in God. When I read Psalm 33 here, I'm reminded of, of the confrontation that uh, the prophet Elijah had with King Ahab, the king of the northern kingdom of Israel during the ninth century uh, BC. Uh, in reading 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 25, we find that there was never a man like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged to worship other gods by his by Jezebel, his wife. Understand, saints of God, the problem is that during this time period, as Elijah, God's prophet, was, was fighting all of the, the spread of what we recognize as idolatry and, and specifically amongst Israel, right? The God's chosen people, Elijah found himself at a masterful confrontation against Ahab, Ahab, Ahab. Understand, saints, that A Eli challenged Ahab and his 850 prophets, and we're talking about 450 prophets of Baal and 450 prophets of Asherah, to meet him on Mount Carmel. And he, this was what I guess what we would call as a fight 
for Israel to recognize who true God is, right? Those were the bystanders is Israel. They just, they, they wouldn't choose who their God would be. As a matter of fact, Elijah even rebuked them for vacillating back and forth on who they church, who they would worship, right? T today, God was good, so we worship God. Today, God didn't seem to do what I wanted him to do, so I'm going to go to Asherah, or I'm going to go to Baal. And the thing is, our God is a jealous God. So this was a direct violation of God's commandment. Elijah proposed between himself and the prophets of Baal and Asherah that they go up on Mount Carmel and that each side would prepare a young bull as a sacrifice, place it on the altar, and whosoever God is God would set this altar on fire receiving the sacrifice. So when the challenge was issued that all morning, the prophets of Baal just, they, they shouted and they praised and they called upon the power of Baal to no avail. There was no response. And right around noon, and, and this is how you know Elijah, Elijah's old school, <laughs> because Elijah sat there and he says, maybe your God sleep. He started taunting them, ta started talking stuff is what we'd say, right? It's like they were on the basketball court and he was that one saying, saying, What's, what's wrong with your shot? You, maybe, maybe it's your wrist. You need to exercise your right wrist to get that release, right? He's just talking smack. But even in talking his smack, the thing is that it, it worked because the prophets of Baal even started more vigorously cutting themselves. I guess they were offering a blood sacrifice to Baal, right? So the prophets of Baal did the best that they could do. Now it's time for God's prophet. If you turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 18, starting at verse 30, it reads, Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins, I guess, because they had not been sacrificing or honoring God in all this time, right? Verse 31 says, Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two says of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it. Uh, the third time the water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench saints of God following this Elijah prayed to the Lord and immediately we found fire falling down from heaven consuming the wood consuming the sacrifice and even lapping up or licking up the water so that it was dry ground there was nothing there even the water in the trench and the people begin to cry out the Lord is God saints of God this reminds me of that Janet Jackson song, What Have You Done For Me Lately? It seems like people just have a tendency that they want to believe in God when he does the next thing and the next thing, right? But then if God doesn't do what they want him to do, then like the Israelites did, they would go find another means or another God or another way to appease what they're trying to achieve in life. Saints, I've got to encourage us that, that when God is our God and we make him our God we accept him as our God either he is your God or he's not and believe it or not these times that you bounce around and you go to your other gods or your other means of satisfying issues and then you come back to God I'm here to tell you he's still not your God what has he done for you lately? As if salvation wasn't good enough, if God never did anything else, coming here on this earth and Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins, for those of us that believe in him shall have eternal life. If he never did anything else to satisfy his purpose, that would be enough. It's not what has he done for you lately, what has he done for you eternally? Let me keep going. After this, after the, the, the Israelites re realized that the Lord is God, 
Uh, Elijah tells them to chase the prophets of Baal, which they do, and, and kill them, which they do. Understand from here, saints, that Elijah prophetically foretold the end of a three-year drought, which, which he started, by the way. He's the one that prayed to God for the drought. But now he prophetically foretells the end of this drought and then and directs Ahab to leave and to go home before the storm comes. The text tells us, meanwhile, and I'm reading uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 45, it says, Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds, the wind rose, a heavy rain came on, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came upon Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Yeah, it, he did. But understand, saints of God, picking up in verse 19, uh, or chapter 19, 1 Kings chapter 19, where it says, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. One thing that always all strikes me, saints, is how us, and I'm talking about us, right? Uh, believers, how we can on Sunday be in such a powerful stasis from praise and worship and hearing God's word. We come out invigorated and ready to live. We get to work on Monday and things start happening and then we feel powerless. And when I say feel powerless, I'm talking about even in our minds, we feel like there's nothing we can do. There's nothing in these circumstances I can do. All I can do is be tossed to and fro by the whims of, of unrighteous leadership. And I'm talking about those of us who have leadership that does not know the Lord or does not even live after God's principles, right? Unrighteous leadership, and they seem to have it in for me, and I don't feel comfortable. I feel like they're conspiring against me, powerless, Monday through Friday, but then comes Sunday. Yeah, we, we feel the power. Understand, saints, that being in this condition is really a state where I have to say it's it's vain. It's a vain state. If truly God was God on Sunday, then he's the same God on Monday to get you through to, 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 to Saturday, right? He's the same God. He's always present. He's always powerful. And I, and I, and I, and I look at Elijah, saints. He's one powerful man of God. He's, he's a man who uh, I mentioned he prayed for the drought and it happened. He's one who stayed with a widow in, in 1 Kings chapter 17 and, and the widow advised that she didn't have much to eat but even while it, she didn't have much Elijah promised her that as, as long as the drought endured they would have food to eat and they did because the prophet said so. Understand, saints, that when the when the prophet's son died, it was Elijah himself who who prayed and, and even resurrected her son. So the boy was raised from the dead. Understand, saints, though. Now we recognize this confrontation between these prophets. And we're talking about 850 prophets of unrighteousness, ungodliness. And God showed up and showed out. You would think this man would always have the confidence that God is with him. But all it took was just a little threat from a little old lady. And yes, she had influence. And yes, she had power. But it, it made, as the texts say, it made Elijah afraid. Yeah, yeah. I anybody ever been there? The thing is, saints, we got to recognize that, that even with all of what was going on here in the text, it's, it is highly likely not only was was Elijah afraid of the physical threat, right? Because this woman was very influential and she promised that he would be dead within the next 24 hours, right? And if she said it and, and her little thugs and goons just floating around, anybody could come up behind him. And if you've seen any of those prison movies where somebody walks up and they just stick, 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 they just start sticking. You know, he was, he was probably concerned about that sticking that was coming. But understand, saints of God, he, he probably was also um, emotionally exhausted. 
emotionally exhausted. I, I'm, I'm bringing this up because I know you've been there. I, I've been there. A time where you've just been through so much. And, and let me help you. When I say emotionally, I also mean spiritually, right? Because we spend so much time in prayer and in the war room. And it seems like just when God overcomes and delivers us from one situation, Satan will pop his ugly head up with another situation. And sometimes it's bigger, but then even sometimes the little ones just seem to annoy you. It's like, when will it ever stop? Well, that's what Elijah was contending with, particularly being one of the one of the, the, the prophets that was running around trying to contend with all of this idolatry and the Israelites. They just didn't seem to get it. I could, I, and, and not that the text says this, but I could see him saying, yeah, today y'all call on the Lord. But then if I go somewhere and go to the next group of Israel, y'all are just going to go back to Baal. It's possible that he felt feelings of isolation. And yes, we know that Elijah was one that really felt like he was in the minority of those that would trust God. Any of us ever feel that way? Like we could be in a room filled with people and we feel like we're the only ones that trust the Lord, that know the Lord. I'm sure he was filled with some doubt and discouragement. He may have questioned whether or not his efforts to confront idolatry were vanity, whether or not he was making a difference. And this brings us really to today's first point coming out of Psalm chapter 33, verse 20. And funny how my first point, it took me a minute to get here, right? How my first point here really is the very last of the text in Psalm 33. It says, verse 20, we wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. And then we talk to him. May our unfailing, may your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. I think it's important for us saints to understand that, that we need to trust in God in our daily lives, right? I know it gets frustrating, and, and I'm going to start in our homes, how we train our children up in the way they should go, right? But the expectation is when they're old, they won't depart. That's why we got to make sure to get the goodness in them, saints. The thing is that when we uh, train them up in the house from, from being young seedlings up to, you know, by the time they go to school and then they run into everybody else in school and everybody else is, is listening to Beyonce and listening to Jay-Z and everybody's listening to Megan the, the Stallion. I, I think I'm pronouncing it right. And, and Big Red or Sexy Red, whatever her name is, right? And and the thing is that they, they forward these links to these people on our kids' phones and guess what? Our kids have the little headphones on so if you're not careful you don't know what or earbuds they're listening to ear ear pods now we don't know what they're listening to our kids find us we find ourselves with our kids being infused and totally being ingested ingesting all of this foolishness in the world if we're not careful that's why i've got to say saints we gotta we have to we have to we have to know what our children are listening to, but it doesn't start with our children. It really starts with us because if we're telling our children to stop listening to that garbage, but then we turn on the TV and the TV has garbage. Y yeah. Yeah. But see, even with that, saints, we have to make sure that, that we play our part in our local. Hear what I say? Our local politics. I know we're waiting to vote in the president of the United States, but, but we haven't even thought twice about our mayor. We haven't thought twice about our city council. We haven't thought twice about the governorship. And if we want to see change take place, it has to take place with us in our home and in our community. We need to be active. We got people running around crying about police brutality, but has anyone the first taken time to go to the police station to introduce yourself? And I can say I do. I have. I have. I have. What, what happens is when the police are familiar with your face or at least familiar with your presence, they now recognize here is another person that they are going to be held accountable for. The thing is, it also lets you know whether or not you have a good police force. And I have to say, most of the police forces that I visited, I really enjoyed the reception. I really enjoyed the opportunity to pray with and pray for our leadership, but then also in city council, just showing up every now and then, every now and then. 
It shows your accountability to, the ability to them and it places an emphasis of their accountability to you. Saints, the goodness of all of this is as much as we do, we can't do anything without God. You can't, you can't, you can't. And I want to go a little deeper because sometimes we say, I know I can't even wake up without God. And that's true. It's God who puts the breath in your body. But the truth is, you don't have salvation without God. I've already expressed that point earlier. I'm not going to beat it up other than to say that you did not save yourself. You cannot save yourself. It took the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross in order for you even to have an opportunity now to trust in him to live eternally with God. Not only that, you can't understand the meaning of life without God. What are you getting that pastor with that one? I'm here to tell you, saints, there's a, there's a lot of people right now wandering and floundering around because they have not and do not listen to the word of God. Guess what? Some of these people are in the church and they make comments like, well, I know God's word says, but, and everything that comes after that but is a whole bunch of mess. All right. That's what comes after the butt is a bunch of mess. Unfortunately, when we when we become those people that that always want to put a butt after uh, I've read God's word, but we end up denying the power of God. We end up denying everything that we've heard the preacher say. We end up hear, hear what I say, rejecting everything that that God has said. Guess what? Now we have no effectual power, and we can't do nothing in the world. I mean it just like I said it. We can't do a thing in the world and that's why we find ourselves going through uh, bouts of depression and bouts of of sickness and bouts of mental just anxiety because we have not trusted in God enough we've trusted in ourselves and now when it's time to find out what's the purpose for all of this we have no point of reference you can't even experience true love yeah you can't you can't uh, and here's my warning to my dating people. You marry somebody that does not know the Lord. And the bottom line of it is you have no promise. You have no hope. Pastor, you, you're a minister of the gospel. You're supposed to bring hope. And you know, well, the thing is that I have to preach what God's word says, right? Understand, saints of God, that when you find yourself marrying up to someone who does not know the Lord, not only do they not have the promise of eternal salvation, you have no promise that they're going to even bring the message or live according to the righteousness that God has defined. The word tells us that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you want to have a faith-filled home, there's got to be some hearing of the word of God, not just by you, but by the entire house. I, I hate to say it, saints of God, but one of the problems is, is that if you're not equally yoked, the, the cart will find itself going in a circle. You're supposed to be with somebody over here. And if they're not as strong as you, you're doing all the pulling. You're going to be pulling in a circle. Or quite often, like many of us, you end up carrying them and end up tiring yourself out. Now going through the potential of being depressed because I've, Lord, I've done all I can do, but my spouse is not working with me. The, the same thing applies to spouses that only half believe what they read too. Let me keep going. Understand saints of God. If we don't have God in our lives, we can't comprehend what true justice is, what true justice is. That's why we try through our human agency in order in order to have a world of equality. We have civil rights and the civil rights movement. The unfortunate side with the civil rights movement is it bought a little bit of change from from the 60s to the 70s to the 80s. Now into 2024, there's been a little bit of change. But unfortunately, if you have a civil rights movement, but you don't rely on on the Holy Ghost movement, what you have is somebody walking, or should I say moving, but they're not progressing. They're making movements, but they're not going anywhere. Yeah, if you put a green screen behind me that looks like I'm running, it looks like I'm running, but really I'm just standing still. A whole lot of wasted motion. We could say the same for the women's liberation movement. Right now, lots of women are fighting for what they want to call equal rights. But saints of God, that's what the word of God is for. You want to see there being some desegregation? I don't care what it looks like publicly. What does it look like in the hearts of men? You want to see a, a difference in racial, gender, or class bias? I don't care what you legislate. What about men's heart? And that's why, even I'm talking to my church people, that's why God wants us to evangelize and share the love of the Lord. Because once we have the Lord's peace, 
We begin to see things from God's eyes. What happens if the people that are your enemies and are working against you begin to see things in a different light? And I'm talking about from God's perspective. And that's why God prepares a table before us and our enemies. Because if we're all eating from his table, guess what? Eventually our enemies become our friends. All of you people that want to talk bad and you can pick which presidential uh, a candidate is running. You talk bad about them all you want, but if you're not praying for them, then you're working against your own best interest. Let me calm down. I'm getting too excited. So let's pick up here in our text, uh, Psalm 33, verse four and five. It says, <clears throat> for the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. I love how the text makes it real clear of the significance of God's word. And, and when we look at God's word, it tells us that it, it is reliable and it is truthful. It is reliable and it's truthful. In other words, if I need something that I can depend on, it's God's word that I can go to. What God says is trustworthy and it is accurate. God's word will offer us, hear this, it will offer us the wisdom the guidance and the understanding for who? For God's people, for God's people, for his people. God is faithful in everything that he does and he gives us his word so that we know his will. One of the things that I encourage young couples when we get involved in relationships with our, you know, with our soon to be spouses is if you want to know about somebody, talk to them and make sure they talk too, right? You don't want somebody just sitting there listening to you all the time. And that's that's contrary to what some of you think is good, right? Well, he just lets me talk and I can just talk and talk and he just listens to everything. You need to listen to that rascal sometime too if you want to know where his head is. That's why couples get married and then the husband begin to share some things. And you're like, well, I didn't know you thought like that. Either one, you didn't give him a chance to talk. And number two, he was quiet for a reason. He knew you wouldn't want to be with him if he told you the truth about himself. The text even tells us that God delights in righteousness and justice, and he promotes these virtues, saints of God, when dealing with humanity. Understand, saints of God, that, that if God truly, truly, truly desires righteousness and justice, he also wants us as believers to dispense it amongst each other. Yeah, that, that ties back into my whole diversity, equity, and inclusion discussion, right? Forget that. What about righteousness? I don't need the DEI or as some say DIE. I don't need it. What I need is life. And I need God's word not only in me, but I need it in the people around me so that we can grow and we can mature as a people, as a nation, and as humanity. Yeah. But the text also says that the earth is full of his unfailing love, which speaks to the fact that there is love that God dispenses to the world. The thing is, the world isn't looking for love, and that's why we don't see it. That's why, that's why right now, Chicago can be used as, as a meme, right? As an analogy of a hostile place where nobody wants to go in order to live or have a life because there's so much death. Let me continue on. I'm almost done. So if we continuing, continue reading in Psalm 33, picking up at verse 6, it says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. I guess today's message really should have been God's word still stands. Because even we find that as the text is specifically speaking of the creative power of our Lord as he created and all it took was for him to speak it. It also highlights how God's word continues to, to sustain us and guide us even today. 
I, I, I know, Pastor, this is about the third time you said this. And, and the thing is, I'm, I'm saying this, saints, because if we really are, are going to trust in the Lord, we've got to trust that he's going to do what he said he's going to do. We've got to trust that God's word is strong enough and powerful enough to, to do what he says it will do. But, but as evidence, we found that in the beginning, when, where the earth was formless and void, it was God who spoke. It was God who brought light. It was God who created the earth. It was God who spoke and, and, and filled the earth with everything that's on it, from the animals to the life, to the sky, to the water. It, uh, it was God who created the, the, firm, the firmament, right? We're talking about the clouds. It was God who spoke these things, and they happened. And here's, here's where I'm going to bless you, and then we're going home. If God could speak creation into its existence, then what makes you think that God can't speak to your situation that you're in in life? If God can speak and fill the earth, what makes you think that God can't speak and fill the your life with nothing but blessings, right? Because everything he created, the text says, and it is good. Understand, saints, that truly when he can speak this goodness into your life, now it's just a matter of you believing that it can be done. This text here encourages us to rely on God's word, to rely on his scripture in order to have a deeper trust in God. We have to come to understanding that God's word is authoritative, that if God says it, he means it. That's what we read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It tells us that all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. If we are really looking to be the righteousness of God, then we have to be in God's word. You can't just listen to a good gospel song and I'm righteous now. I, I've got a holy feel. We can't just come to church on Sunday and listen to a good message and walk out. But we never get into God's word in order to be filled with God's authority. I'm going to say this again in case you missed it. We have to be in God's word to be filled with his authority. Now, don't miss misconstrue what I'm saying because I'm not saying now that we have the authority in us we can go out and we can tell people what to do and, and we can speak and it's going to happen a million bucks right now in my hand thus says the Lord Rolls Royce in my driveway right now shazam and it happens because that's exactly what it is it's, just, it's witchcraft the question is when you receive the authority in you do you really see God's purpose in what he's given you and then what you say will begin Hear what I say. We'll begin to have power and impact. God's word is inerrant. There are no mistakes. Psalm chapter 19, verse 7 states, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Understand that if really, and, and I'm speaking as one who, who was once foolish, it actually took me to be in God's word to recognize my foolish ways. And even as, as, as wise as I am, I'm still recognizing some foolishness that just God needs to work out. And if, if we can be honest with ourselves, it takes us being in God's word because we always come across something that's like, oh my goodness, really? I hadn't considered that. But the next thing is for the change to take place. That's right, the transformation. Last but not least, God's word is sufficient. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 tells us his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Saints, truly, if God's word is sufficient, that means I don't need to rely on any, any, anything or anyone else for wisdom. And, and don't get me wrong, God places us in each other's lives to encourage us, encourage each other in wisdom and righteousness. But, but understand that, that the, the blessing comes when those that are around us are actually speaking God's. Now that's some guidance I can use. And that's why I'm always careful when, when you get around in groups of be it male or female or whatever groups that you get in and people start, well, if I were you, 
I'm sorry, I kind of I kind of put up my extra block because if the next the next words that come out of your mouth, if they're not scripture, I'm gonna measure them heavily. Yeah, they, they get weighted heavily, heavily on a heavenly scale as to whether or not they are truly righteousness. But oh, if you tell me, trust in the Lord with all your heart, don't lean to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge the Lord, he will make your path straight. I know that's word, and I know that's encouragement enough to know that if I continue to trust in God, regardless of my circumstances, I know I can go just a little bit farther. Maybe that should have been the subject of my message today, saints, because even in our text, as we read all of Psalm 33, I wanted us to recognize that at the end of the day, now I recognize, starting at verse 1, why there's a song that's being sung to the Lord who is righteous, fitting, here it is, fitting for the upright to praise. This song is to glorify our Lord because he is worthy. Somebody ought to look at your neighbor right now and say, God is worthy. He's worthy of our praise. It goes on to say, praise the Lord with the heart. Make music to him in the 10th string lyre. Whatever instrument I have, I'm going to glorify my God. We're going to get our jam on. But understand, saints, that the text even goes on to say, Sing to him a new song, play skillfully and shout for joy, for the word of the Lord is right and true. You mean to tell me all this singing and all this glorifying and all this praising I'm doing is because of God's word? You don't have a gospel song unless you're singing God's word. You don't have a gospel ministry unless it's aligned with God's word. Let me help you. You are not a Christian unless you're trusting in God's word. The world is just mimicking what they think they want in order to be successful. But the truth is, we have the truth. We don't have to mimic a thing. We have the authentic articles. We have what God intends for us to resolve any solution. And now that I have God's word, and now that I believe what God says, the only thing left to say is I, I trust him. I trust him. If you can speak, everything that's around me into existence, then I trust you could speak to my little old circumstances in life. But truly, Lord, you can send fire down from heaven and destroy, I mean destroy everything that is sacrificed to you, including those things that will work against, I'm talking about the water uh, in, in Elijah, the water that was poured on this poured on the sacrifice right you pour water on something and maybe it might last because the water may protect it but the Lord scorched it then truly you can protect me from my enemies and if you choose not to protect me I'll know I'll be with you in glory satisfying your purpose trusting in you when in essence you really did protect me from my enemies just not in the way I expected and that's why we need to pray like our Lord Jesus Christ when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but your will. Let your will be done. That's the prayer, saints. To go to the next level in your faith of trusting God, being God's word, trust God's word, live in God's word. Amen. Precious and almighty Lord, we thank you for this word today. And though we recognize we are humans, we fall short and we, we fail on a continuous basis, Lord. We recognize that you are God almighty and everything that you've made and everything that you are is perfect. So allow us, dear Lord, as believers to believe in your word that you've given us that is perfect. Allow us, dear Lord, to trust that your Holy Spirit is doing an effectual work in our lives so that now we can live we can live a life free of fear. We can live a life free from sin. We can live a life free from hatred. A life free indeed 
absolutely, 100% free, eternally connected to you through Jesus. Have your way with the hearer of this word, dear Lord. Have your way with our lives as we trust in you in all things. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.